tale as old as this now overused phrase. The girl gets imprisoned by Selfish Beast, eventually falls for Selfish Beast. Beast transforms into no, not selfish, handsome prince. Happily ever after. Well, not quite. Beauty and the Beast's older tellings actually have a lot more <laughs> juicy details in romance and unselfish beasts than we find in Disney's version. And contrary to most every other creepy fairy tale origin ever, this one holds up to and even surpasses the modern retelling in respectable interactions. I love these tales and I hope you do too. So let's go seek adventure in the great wide somewhere and along the way, we'll find out just who is the real beast in Beauty and the Beast. Now I have to say there are quite a lot of modern retellings of this tale. I'm using Disney's as a reference point because a lot of people recognize it instantly at a glance or are familiar with it enough through osmosis. Disney does take a lot of liberties with this story, which suits it just fine, I think. This story has roots and versions as early as 4,000 years ago, and lovers transforming into beasts is not an uncommon theme in tales. Today, we are traveling back to around 1697 when Charles Perrault wrote his tale La Belle et la Bête, or Beauty and the Beast. Then we fast forward to 1740 in which French novelist Gabrielle Suzanne de Villeneuve penned her more saucy version of the tale. This was abridged and published by Jean-Marie Le Prince de Beaumont 16 years later in 1756, and is extremely similar to Perrault's. And in 1889, it appears in Andrew Lang's book as the one we are mostly familiar with today. So, what we have now is from a centuries-long game of telephone, each telling, losing a bit along the way, and adding something else in as well. Between these works, there are also other variants and versions, as well as operas and plays too. In this video, I'm focusing mainly on Villeneuve and Perrault with some Beaumont for good measure. And of course, I do need to mention Madame d'Aulnay, who predates Perrault, as many of her tales have set the stage for this beautiful story. Once upon a time, in Villeneuve's tale, our heroine is of course the youngest, most humble, and beautiful child of twelve. Twelve! Imagine. Both Beaumont and Perrault have it as a mere six. Three sons, three daughters. And maybe Disney keeps this number alive with Gaston's wanting six or seven strapping boys. Their father insists they all be well read. Perhaps this is where Disney got the bookworm side of Belle. Anyway, the youngest is so beautiful that everyone literally calls her Beauty, or in French, Belle, that stayed in Disney. Beauty has suitors who she turns down to stay with her father, who is a wealthy merchant, not an eccentric inventor. Unfortunately, his fortune gets lost at sea, so he has to move the huge family to a smaller house in the country. The tales go into great detail about all the new work that children have to do to keep the house running, but my favorite bit is that Beauty, resigned to it and finding she enjoys it, sometimes sings to her spinning. She is actually super content with the provincial life, or at least determined to make the most of it, much to the chagrin of her sisters. One year later, the father goes on a promising business trip and, like in every tale ever, asks all his children what they'd like as gifts. Predictably, they all ask for expensive jewels and dresses, but Beauty humbly asks for nothing but his safe return, infuriating her jealous and haughty siblings. She is prevailed upon and then asks only for a beautiful rose, like none from around there. And this rose did make it into the Disney tale, but in an enchanted timer sort of way. The business venture turns out to be unsuccessful, and the father's journey home is not easy. In Villeneuve's tale, he gets lost at sea, and in other tales, it's a woods 30 miles from his home. But regardless, he seeks refuge in a seemingly empty castle, where a roaring fire awaits and a meal is laid out for him. Perhaps by the invisible owner, he thinks. Maybe this is what inspired Disney's enchanted servants. Next morning, he awakes, drinks some chocolates, um, yum, sees the most beautiful rose in a garden, and plucks it. The castle's owner, a hideous beast, confronts him for stealing his most prized possession after partaking in his hospitality. I'm sorry, but there's just something so sweet about a huge beast tending and delighting in roses. Can't be that bad. The merchant explains that the flower is a gift for his daughter, and the beast is willing to trade the merchant's imprisonment for the imprisonment of one of his daughters on one condition. The merchant must be absolutely honest about what the trade involves, no sugarcoating it or anything. The beast insists that the woman fully consent to the situation. I kind of love the beast for presenting his invitation with complete transparency to the daughters. No illusions, no trickery, what you see is what you get. Which I find rather refreshing, both today and especially in an older tale. I mean, still not condoning it or anything, but 
Anyway, the father is willing to stay, but the beast sends him home with a chest full of treasure for his family, just in case the daughters refuse and the father has to return. At least the family will have some money. Oh, what a guy. Disney's Beast is a selfish child, essentially, who plans on keeping Belle's father prisoner for no other reason than ego, really. Only when Belle comes to investigate does he accept her in his place. He is gruff and grumbles at his servants coaching him to be more kind, although he does try. He does have a bit of a temper that gets tampered over time. <laughs> in almost complete contrast, earlier beasts insist on not being called my lord, hate compliments and value above all, people who speak what they think. The merchant returns home and hearing her father's plight, it is Beauty, of course, who loves her father too much for him to suffer for her rose, who agrees to the beast's terms. Her brothers are all for killing the beast, just like Gaston and Disney. Before she leaves, her father confides in her about the beast's gift of treasure. She kindly advises him to keep it a secret from her sisters and to arrange marriages for them so they can be comfortable. They didn't like roughing it in the country. They, however, are so hard-hearted that they rub onions on their eyes to feign sadness at her departure. She does not cry for fear grief will overtake her. Disney hints at some Bluebeardian type of beast with his forbidding bell to go into the West Wing. What, is he hiding six previous wives in there or something? But this is actually not in the original tellings. The early beast welcomes Beauty to the castle with fireworks in the shape of her freaking initials. Awesome. On her first night in the castle, a woman appears to Beauty in a dream and tells her that her sacrifice for her father will have its rewards. In the following months, she has the run of the lavish castle and explores every nook and cranny, massive libraries, intricate aviaries, and more. She is not barred from the West Wing or any such place and, in fact, is given a book upon which is written, Wish what you like, command what you will. You alone are the queen and mistress here. She wishes to see her father, and lo, in a magic mirror, oh, that made it in, she sees a vision of her father. She enjoys meals during which she is entertained with a delightful concert, although no creature was visible. Oh, a creepy be our guest? Spooky, sign me up. She has delightful and candid conversations with the beast, and finds him more humane and kind than many men. In Vilmov, each night the beast asks Beauty to sleep with him. Oh boy, very direct, very saucy. At first, she was afraid he would be angry if she refused, but he assures her that whatever her answer is, he will be kind. And is. In Beaumont's tale, he asks her to marry him each day. Beauty keeps refusing him in both stories, but the beast is considerate of her boundaries and the two do grow fond of each other over the course of three months. Beauty has nightly, um, dreams of a handsome man and begins to fall in love with this stranger. A dream fairy keeps showing up and telling her not to be fooled by appearances, but no connection is made. One day, Beauty sees, via magic mirror, that her father is ill with the loss of her. She asks the beast to let her visit for a week, or in Vilnov, two months. And although he says that the grief of not having her there will kill him, he will do anything for her happiness. She is transported via magic ring to her bedroom at home, and trunks of diamond-encrusted dresses follow her there, courtesy of the beast. She wants to give some to her unhappily married sisters, but the gowns disappear at her very thought. It's clear they are meant only for her. Her sisters, jealous, conspire a way to keep Beauty home for longer than she had planned, so that the beast will die of grief for her. They for once treat her so kindly that she stays for 10 days, or in Beaumont, another week. In Vilnov, her sisters are about to be wed, and once Beauty shows up, their suitors have eyes only for Beauty, which understandably annoys them. In this tale, Beauty's brothers love her too much to send her back to the Beast. Anyway, after too much time has passed, Beauty dreams of the Beast, laying, dying on the castle grounds. Her heart aches. It is clear now that she loves him, so she sets her ring out, falls asleep, and wakes in the castle, where she dresses to impress the Beast then waits until 9 o'clock in the evening when he usually swings by for conversation and marriage proposal to seek him out? Where's the urgency here? When he doesn't show, she fears she has caused his death and runs yelling for him through the castle. She finds him as in her dream, lying in the garden and rushes to him and throws water at him to revive him. Says he, you forgot your promise. In my grief at losing you, I determined to let myself die of hunger. But I die happy since I have had the joy of seeing you once again. To which Beauty replies, No, my dear beast, you shall not die. You shall live to be my husband. She now realizes that what she thought was friendship was actually love. 
all of a sudden there are fireworks hmm, and the castle lights up music plays and a celebration unfolds the beast disappears and a very handsome prince is at beauty's feet in Villeneuve's tell, this is the prince that Beauty kept dreaming about nightly, so she's pretty happy about this. He reveals the terms of his curse by a wicked fairy, who had transformed him into a beast until a damsel would consent to marry him. He could not mention the curse until now, and he could only use his good heart to woo a lady. This is like exactly the opposite of Disney, who has their enchantress as good, and the beast as deserving of punishment for his unkindness. The prince there was cursed because he was a brat. This guy was the whole package all along. Anyway, in both Perot and Beaumont, Beauty and the Prince stroll through the castle, and Beauty is delighted to see that the woman from her dreams, apparently a famous fairy who we didn't know about until the end of the tale, has brought her entire family to the castle to celebrate. The fairy turns Beauty's sisters into statues, and their consciousnesses are preserved beneath the stone which encases them, to forever witness Beauty's happiness. They will be unable to change back unless they admit their many faults, and the fairy has every notion that they will remain statues forever. The end. Villeneuve's ending is slightly different and gets very technical with Beauty's eligibility to marry the now transformed prince. After the curse is broken, the dream fairy and the prince's mother show up in a golden carriage. What timing? The queen had to leave to fight a war, leaving her son in the care of an evil fairy who tried to seduce him when he was old enough and then cursed him when he refused her. This queen will not allow Beauty, someone with no connections or status, to marry her son. The Dream Fairy then conveniently reveals that Beauty is her niece, whose real father is not the merchant, but the queen from Happy Island's brother. Wowza, that feels way random and like a stretch. Anyway, they get married and happily ever after. So, with the original tales and Disney's more modern interpretation, and heck, we'll throw in Rumple too for good measure, he's the stand-in for Beast in Once Upon a Time, I'm pretty sure, the true Beast of Beauty and the Beast is... Mrs. Potts. I mean, she one has a favorite child, Chip, who seems to be the only one she lets out of the cupboard, and two, if they were all locked up in that cupboard when the spell was broken, wouldn't all those now transformed children also now be... broken? They wouldn't all fit in that small cupboard, broken bones and such galore. How cruel, Mrs. P, how cruel. But in all seriousness, the beast in older tales is far more humane than most of the humans, and that was kind of the point. By the end of their tale, Disney makes this point clear too at last with their character of Gaston acting more selfish, rash, and unkind in all of his super toxic masculinity than the changed beast. And it's not just Gaston, the whole village goes along with the unjust locking up of Maurice and the plot to eliminate the beast, not to mention the self-serving asylum caretaker. I rather admire the beast in older versions, apart from the whole keeping beauty as punishment deal. But what are some of your thoughts? Which version of the tale do you prefer? Let me know in the comments below. Oh, and before I wrap up our adventure today, I wanted to let you know that I've started a second channel, a bit late, where I tell two stories per week. It's more freeform and I've got fairy tales, ghost stories, and currently reading the full Alice in Wonderland. So if you can't sleep and need more stories more often, consider checking it out. I'll see you there, Night Owl Supremes. Thank you for stopping by and watching this video. If you want to know the second the next one comes out, please do be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell in all its subcategory glory. YouTube has been weird lately. Okay, I'll see you soon in the next video. Goodbye!